I have an affinity with nature which is entirely emotional. I feel a tremendous charge when I'm walking in nature. And I have the wild grasses around me, the wild wheat and, and the wild flowers. And I'm never happier uh, than when I'm painting that. hundredth anniversary of the first Japanese pioneer in Canada, a gift of sound, of gratitude and thankfulness. that red-winged blackbird. You know, you know what they're singing? They're singing, I see you. Hear that? that that's, that's exactly it. how it sounds. That's it. You know, this natural setting, I often think of how different it is from the natural setting of my prison camp and our, uh, that was built on a level area with uh, not a chance of anything growing. It was almost like uh, built on cinders with not a tree, not a shrub, nothing, absolutely flat. It was uh, once in a while going, going to work to the shipyards, we'd see in the window of a house one little flower pot with a little flower. It would give me a little charge. Well, our, our uh, camp was just full of nature. We were up in the Rockies, and uh, it's a total contrast to the, your story. In my case, uh, nature became absolutely meaningful because uh, when your own country turns its back on you, there's nothing to rely on. You become somebody almost floating in air and trying to grapple and uh, get some stability. And especially a child, uh, you know, about 13. And for me, nature became the solace that I could hang on to. Most POWs can't uh, really put it out of their minds, and uh, it comes up in so many different ways. But it's been a very positive thing in one sense, that it's, uh, it's given me a sense of value to each day, each moment. All I have to do is compare what my day today uh, looks like compared to how it was uh, one day there and suddenly I'm I'm in heaven again uh, I live each moment and each moment is precious whether it's a question of something I eat or, or a walk I take or a, a thing I'm painting the sound of the surf the sound of the wind in the trees, the breathing of gods. The practice of architecture is to me like trying to climb Mount Everest, and that's the beauty of architecture. The magic of life happens where three natural elements, land, air, and water, come together. It's fascinating when you think about it in the English language. L for land, A for air, and W for water. That spells law. As a child growing up in Vancouver, my life was extremely simple. That's because I had decided to be an architect 
at the age of four and a half. That decision really made life very simple. I had to go to kindergarten, to public school, to high school, and to university. And so that's what I was going to do, and uh, so life was laid out. And you may be asking why I decided to be an architect when I was uh, four and a half. Well, it happened because uh, I had a, a terrible uh, burn, and uh, I nearly lost my life, and I was in bed for eight months. Now, while I was healing, uh, I used to look out the window and uh, see a construction going on. Once in a while, a man used to come around here, and I think he had a pipe and uh, a roll of paper, and he used to unroll it, and then everybody would gather around, and, uh, and he would be giving them instructions, and uh, uh, the construction would go on. And, and I, I thought, well, maybe somebody thinks about buildings, and uh, I wanted to be a person who thinks about it, not the person who builds it. Before I knew it, I was right in the middle of a war I hadn't planned on, hadn't been trained for, hadn't been prepared for, and suddenly I was in the front line and I was fighting. Everyone but me seemed to be able to crouch behind adequate rock cover as I settled in disgust behind a threadbare bush, aiming my rifle. A figure was dead center in my sights, silhouetted against the sky as I pulled the trigger. He dropped. A thought vaguely registered that I had just killed a man. I thought of the books I'd read of the young soldier's emotions at the first kill. And what did I feel? Nothing. I was sleepwalking through an ugly fantasy, a phantom in a surrealist dance. There seemed no rhyme or reason to the anarchic battle going on around us. And here I believed it was where I was going to die. I, I was here until about uh, age 12 uh, when I had to leave school. And at that time, uh, it was a very insecure period, uh, especially for somebody uh, at that age. Um, I was told that uh, I was not to go out uh, in the evening because uh, I could be shot. And I used to say, you know, what? Be shot in Canada and shot because uh, you're a Japanese? I, I just couldn't believe it, but uh, I was told that that's, that's the possibility. And uh, that's when the, the war started, and uh, my father was given two days' notice to go to a camp. And it's the first time that uh, he pulled me aside uh, in the shop and said, uh, Raymond, you know, I'm going to speak to you man to man. Uh, I'm given this notice to go to a camp, but I'm going to resist because I came to Canada for democracy, for individual rights. And uh, Canada has gone to war on that basis. And now I have to fight the contradiction. And he said that there, there, there was no other way. And uh, when he was taken away uh, two days later uh, by, the, by the Mounties, uh, I was uh, very proud of my father. And of course, uh, I had to leave the school and uh, look after my two sisters my pregnant mother, and I tried to run the store. And it really was savage. We had no choice but to go to the Pacific National Exhibition holding area with mother. She had a miscarriage, and I wondered what miscarriage was all about. How did mother lose my potential brother in her womb? I wonder how I was going to keep her happy and my two younger sisters. I could not help wondering why Canada was incarcerating us. We received our straw mattresses and we were led to our place, which was a horse stall with two double bunks, one on each side. We tossed the straw mattress onto the beds and we sat down, two of us on each side, looking at each other and feeling pretty low. Then we looked at the corner of the horse stall and we saw these thousands of bugs crawling up and down the corner 
and we looked at each other and we just cried. North Point Concentration Camp, Hong Kong. I think it was formerly a stable for horses. We slept on vermin-ridden bunks and subsisted on moldy rice, working long, hard hours in the searing heat. Before the work parties began, I was able to get in some painting. I used canvas liberated from a tent flap by night, stolen crankcase oil for coloring, fingers, and bristles from a shoe brush wired to a stick. These were images from around camp recolored later in Japan. One fine day, a new interpreter came to camp. We were delighted because he was a man that spoke perfect English. He was brought up in Kamloops. He was Japanese Canadian. And uh, we thought this was a wonderful new development. And we would have much more understanding and rapport. But uh, what we got instead was a great lesson in race relations. This man, Kamloops somehow has, or somewhere had learned to hate everything white and Canadian and uh, his punishments were awesome and murderous he was monstrous but watching him in action I got to wondering whatever happened to him how did he get this way I mean here's a man who was brought up amongst us in our country. I mean, what did they do to him? As I started conjuring up visions of him back home as a child, and I conjured up visions of him being uh, beaten, jeered at, isolated from the people around him, uh, building up this, this anger, this hate. And uh, my conjectures were right. He told us sometimes, from time to time, how he'd been treated as a child. He said, uh, when he was 10, he gave us an example. They, they invited all the kids in his class to a party, but not him. He said, they called me a dirty, uh, yellow little Jap bastard, and they wouldn't have anything to do with me. That's what they thought of me. And we called him the Kamloops Kid, and uh, that's the name that stuck with him uh, till the time of his death. When he was finally, after the war, he was executed uh, for his war crimes. He had uh, caused the death of so many people. Yeah, living in a tent in the wintertime uh, was kind of miserable. And uh, we were very happy when uh, we were able to move into to a half a, a unit, which was uh, 13 feet by 13 feet uh, uh, in Bay Farm. And in many ways, uh, I guess for me, uh, my adventure started uh, from the moment we started to settle in Bay Farm. Uh, we had two communal bathhouse. And uh, I guess I, I was in a very kind of a unfortunate situation in that I, I was still healing from uh, this uh, uh, bad burn and uh, uh, you know, I had scars. Uh, on my back and so on. And uh, so, uh, you know, when I go to the bath, uh, uh, the, 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 the kids, and not only the kids, but the adult used to taunt me. And uh, so, uh, you know, I felt I was getting attacked from uh, every side. Uh, uh, you know, Canada turning its back on us. And then my own community is sort of, uh, uh, you know, not, understanding, uh, but being almost vicious. Uh, and so I thought, well, you know, I, I prefer to take a bath somewhere else. And so I started to build a, this, it, it was, it didn't start as a tree house, but uh, a place to see if people were coming. And when nobody was around, I would jump into the, the river and take a bath. And uh, this continued, but as it continued, this, uh, this uh, structure started to evolve. And uh, I used to go and borrow some lumber from the lumber yard, and uh, the man was good enough to give me that. And, uh, and I was working as a, a carpenter's help, so I had nails and uh, a hammer that uh, I was able to borrow. And uh, this is 
how the, the tree house evolved. And uh, the tree house was absolutely wonderful because uh, it gave me a chance to get away and, uh, and just think, to watch nature. And uh, I, I guess in a, in a funny way, maybe I was uh, trying to think my way through this uh, situation. I was saying to myself, I have to try my best not to let it happen to other people. And uh, uh, it, it was a strong emotional sort of uh, promise I made to myself. Because uh, part of it was uh, the idea that, uh, you know, it's just this insensitivity, the insensitivity of man to man. But in many cases, it's uh, insensitivity of an institution to, to people. And uh, n not by malice, but just insensit insensitivity. And I thought, well, because I had decided by, you know, uh, to be an architect, I thought, well, maybe as an architect, I could do something about this. We were brought from Hong Kong to Japan to work in the shipyards at Kawasaki. I was Samjaku Nijugo, number 325. I stared at the dreary, rainy shore and was overwhelmed by a sensation of total defeat, of being stranded on an unknown planet. Nothing was familiar. Despair filtered into my bones like the descending rain. Never had I been so hopelessly distant, so cut off from life as I'd known it. Hong Kong had been British, with the conquerors as intruders. Here the transformation was total. Our entire identity was to be removed. We were now chattel slaves brought to an alien land with its alien culture, its alien language. There seemed no exit this side of the grave. The winter was bitterly cold. Arriving in winter from tropical Hong Kong, many Canadians succumbed to pneumonia. In a camp north of here, 80 men died in the first three months. At night, in our camp, it was a common sight to see hunched prisoners, their feet burning from berry berry, breaking the ice on the fire buckets to shove their feet in as they shivered under a thin blanket. A more desolate portrait of misery would be hard to find. In 1944, uh, the, the government realized that uh, my father was uh, harmless. Uh, and uh, so they, they let him out, out of the POW camp. Uh, it was a, a great uh, news and uh, we started to prepare ourselves uh, to move out of the camp. And we were given uh, a whole train, uh, really a rickety old uh, wooden sort of a train that uh, was, had a, a pot stove. And uh, as we moved uh, through various towns. Uh, I guess we were spectacles. Uh, you know, here's a, you know, one of the first Japanese uh, Canadian family moving out east and, uh, you know, what the hell do they look like? And, uh, you know, are they, you know, yellow and slant eye and buck teeth and all that. August 15th, 1945. I knew it was finally over. Suddenly in camp there was no work. Parading for the camera, freedom. After all this, it was almost too much. I tried to sort it all out in my diary. What would it be like back in our world? With freedom came strange emotions. Desire, rage, a wanting. But wanting what? Revenge, women, love, it was all a jumble. We were walking scarecrows, but we were now the victors. Smitty had led us to somewhere we could find women. Not a brothel, but some institution. I remember searching the rooms, and suddenly, there she was. Long, flowing black hair cascading down over a blue kimono. I had only to encircle her, but she was mine. 
You have the power, the right, my voice was screamed, but I faltered. She read the uncertainty and floated around me, and she seemed to vanish through the door like a ghost. I stood paralyzed, furious. You miserable ninny, my voice has said. You'll never get a chance like that again. You are doomed to virginity for life. I walked over to her table to see what she was working at. Oh my God, an art student at work on a half-finished painting. I looked at her work and grimaced. Rank amateur, struggling timidly to master the rudiments of light and shadow. I seized her brushes and set to work, correcting her errors. Soon I was happily lost in a world of vibrant color, light and shadow. Pleasant melodies of line and rhythm tinkled in my head as I worked. We were joined, this lovely girl and I, enmeshed in a spirit of sensual play. Our love was being consummated in a language of color, light, spirit. At last I laid aside the brushes and surveyed the result. I smiled, envisioning her face. Surprise, Madame Butterfly. Please accept this little love sonnet from over the ocean. We did make it after all, didn't we? Word had it around town that uh, a very multi-talented uh, fellow by the name of William Allister was about to descend on Montreal. And uh, the, the comments were very very favorable. Most of the females uh, of my age at that time during the war were used to not having male energy around at that age. It seemed that uh, destiny had it that we were to meet because uh, we were uh, fixed up on a blind date shortly afterwards. And uh, yes, he did turn out to be handsome and he was charming. Uh, and I really was, was uh, th there was a definite attraction right from the beginning. Uh, at the same time, uh, with all this uh, charm and, and humor, uh, he was on his best behavior, of course, uh, there was a sadness and, and a melancholy about the eyes that uh, I found very moving and uh, in, a, in a very funny way affected me. I felt like I wanted to protect this man because I had read all about what they had gone through. And uh, he seemed so sensitive and so vulnerable. There was a point in time, I came to the conclusion that uh, I would fight for all this negative things, you know, in life, like uh, fight for democracy and, and fight for the fragility of uh, uh, democracy uh, and fight for nature and uh, fight for uh, a justice. But in order to do that, I, I found myself finding, uh, needing to get rid of some of the, the bitterness I felt. In my search, uh, first I, I uh, focused on the, the object of my anger. And then I went into uh, the whole background of the object. In this, in this case, it was the Japanese military uh, that had uh, uh, that my emotions uh, were directed at. Then I went into the whole history of the Japanese military, where the spirit come f came from, all the historical circumstances that produced these events. And then my Buddhist understanding gave me uh, a realization that uh, whatever, uh, see, even if one single individual did me uh, dirt, 
that single individual in one way could be me. If I were born when he was born under those circumstances, subjected to the same moral precepts and, uh, and value systems, uh, I could do exactly what he was doing. And maybe that's the difference, I guess. Uh, you, you were facing a clear enemy and that you have to resolve. I was facing my country <laughs> and, you know, how do I resolve that? And you cannot, you just cannot hate your own country. In prison camp, uh, I, as a result of uh, long walks and thinking about my situation, I realized that the enemy in prison camp we're not soldiers with a gun or machine guns. The enemy was boredom and hunger. And I decided to fight those in my own way. But when I got out of prison camp and I got into uh, this lovely situation, I realized that if I was going to survive, I had better concentrate on health. And health involved studying my body, uh, the meaning of diet, and exercise uh, to uh, counteract a lot of the physical problems I was facing. If I was going to survive ordinary life, the war still was going on, only the enemy had a new face. And the face was health, staying alive. And that's why, although this seems strange, it makes a lot of sense in the overall picture. Uh, he's very disciplined about his diet because I think he has the sense that if he doesn't, that he, he could, it, it, his health could deteriorate. And uh, he's, he's really remarkable, the way he really sticks to it and manages to still lead a productive life and still be cheerful and uh, curious and, and do the things that he wants to do and uh, paint. Uh, I think he's been more creative now than he has been in, in all the years that I know him. Take the temporary growing greenery and turn it into an eternal object and images and I give it immortality so it'll last longer than we will. does it for the snow. It's almost complete. At the office, uh, we use a phrase, uh, two L's. The first L stands for uh, listen very hard, so that you could, you know, lead to the second L and that is to uh, take leadership in design. And uh, so I guess even that idea of uh, listening hard comes from the, the, the days of the camp because uh, as a, a young person, I used to think, well, if the government had listened a little more carefully, 
you know, and have been a little more understanding, a little more compassionate, uh, a lot of the things that happened to the Japanese Canadians would not have happened. When I was uh, going through university, uh, uh, I, I, I was a real bastard. Uh, I, I was really interested in design and uh, uh, I, I, I think uh, to a point where I used to tell the professors that there was nobody, you know, like uh, capable of uh, teaching me because I was better in design than most of them. Uh, in fact, at one point I said all of them put together. <laughs> I don't say that kind of thing anymore. That's it. And another one. Oh, you, you guys have jackets. Oh, good. In the back. Raymond Moriyama believes that the spirit is a prime element of reality. And he has devoted his life to the creation of places where the spirit can dwell and flourish and soar. In 1958, when I started my practice of architecture, I was bluntly told by my professor that I would be a total and miserable failure for four reasons. <laughs> One, because I did not have enough capital. Well, I thought, uh, $392 was a lot of money. Two, because I was too young. Three, because there was a recession. And finally, he said, because I was an Oriental. A Canadian, yes, but an Oriental of Japanese ancestry. He told me that I will be clawed apart in business, especially for this last reason. Perhaps, I thought, but I have more faith in Canadians and in Canada. I had various careers. First came acting in Hollywood, and after the publication of my first book, the whole family moved to this art colony in Mexico where I could start on my next novel. And this was the happiest year of my life. And here I started to paint seriously. I set myself up and started to experiment, searching, searching, searching. And every weekend I did another painting. And by the end of a year, I had accumulated quite a few. And uh, there was um, an exhibition for that was open to everybody at the local main gallery. And uh, I entered about uh, 10 of them and uh, they all sold very quickly and uh, the public uh, really responded in a way that uh, was beyond my fa fondest dreams and I realized that this there may be something <laughs> I've got something here I don't have to go back to advertising Will had always said early in our relationship that he somehow he knew that he had to get back to Japan I don't think he understood in what 
shape or form or, or even when. But he was very eager to uh, share the, the site and, and all these places he had been to with me and to see Japan under peacetime circumstances. When I returned to Japan, my fellow POWs thought me barmy. What in the world was I doing returning to a country that held so many nightmare associations? I had my reasons, mad as they might be, but strong enough to bring me back across the Pacific. I knew I must return, not only to Japan, but to the scene of the crime. Camp 3D in Kawasaki, back in the shipyards. To my surprise, the Japanese didn't try to sweep me under the carpet. I was given the VIP treatment. Nothing hidden. They even made it a media event. A special limousine came to collect us at our Tokyo hotel and drove us in state to Yokohama. We rolled into the shipyards toward a welcoming committee of top brass, a sort of triumphal re-entry. The man who gave the order for this reception, I later learned, was a survivor of Hiroshima. I felt like the pilot in Shogun arriving in Japan, a prisoner marked for death, and ending up an honored guest in the halls of the mighty. This exalted treatment was accorded us not only here, but throughout our stay, from the highest to the lowest, in homes, shops, and streets. Well, I'm looking for familiar signs. I'm not finding very many. All I meet here are ghosts. A lot of ghosts wandering around here. Probably as uh, lost as I am. Visiting a temple one day, I saw an ancient ceremony, the dressing of a high-end princess in 12 layered robes. And as I watched, there came a flash of knowing. I saw my bitterness, my hostility, my wounds, like her body being gently covered in layer upon layer of exquisitely colored and embroidered robes, transforming me into a new being. I felt a new, broader vision take over. I would paint as I'd never painted before. Paint a path to peace. Visions of giant canvases marrying east and west unfolded before me. These tiny flute notes of reconciliation might stir a calming breeze somewhere among the discordant winds of our planet. It was worth a try to offer this quiet plea of greater understanding and a spirit of forgiving. To really understand was to forgive. In 1975, uh, I took a year out and uh, followed uh, in the footsteps of Buddha. And uh, a uh, Hindu uh, leader lent me these uh, elephants so that I could go and uh, visit the place where Buddha was uh, meditating. This one is a family of Sherpa. Uh, they took me in and uh, it, it was amazing because, uh, you know, I asked myself, you know, would, if I knocked on that strange door in Toronto, would they take me in? And the answer is no. Ah, the Bodhi tree. This is a, a Bodhi tree uh, where uh, Buddha was enlightened. And uh, I could have uh, reached up and took a leaf off the, the tree, but I just couldn't. I, I just s sat there uh, cross-legged and uh, waited. Uh, it must have been two to three hours for a leaf to come down naturally and that particular leaf I've uh, carefully put between pages in a book and uh, when I returned to Toronto I presented it to uh, the Toronto Buddhist Church. 
This is called returning as a bird, and um, this uh, peacock is a sort of a, a reincarnation of many things, uh, according to the viewer. That could be the reincarnation of the, the rich shogun that built the golden pavilion, or it could be me, the returning warrior. The peacock is uh, the symbol of the enlightened warrior, and uh, that's what I thought I was when I came back in 1983 to uh, Japan. Now, in this one, I'm trying uh, for a certain mysterious element, ghostly element, uh, suggested by the, these ancient No characters. And uh, I wanted to take the No theater characters, which started way back in the 12th century, and bring their, some of their ancient glories coming through. He's got the, the masks of the No theater and the musicians like the Greek chorus uh, on the stage and the, the tree element in the background. And this is uh, a kabuki character, uh, came later, close to 16th, 17th century, but um, I combined them all in a sort of a dream-like effect. Well, well uh, that's very interesting uh, you mentioned this kabuki, because kabuki was uh, a source of uh, inspiration for me, for the... Uh, Canadian Embassy uh, Theater. Really? And uh, there the attempt was to take the very early Kabuki Theater, which took place out in the open field, under trees, under the stars. And so when, when one walks into this uh, theater, you'll see uh, fiber optic stars and uh, metallic trees, and, uh, and uh, it, it has that quality about it. In many ways, the Canadian Embassy is a treehouse. The main entry uh, into the Canadian Embassy is on the fourth floor, like a treehouse. Yeah. The treehouse is where wonderful things happen. Wonderful human interaction happens. Wonderful thoughts, wonderful dreams, and uh, determination could happen. Yes. And uh, so, in many ways, because uh, the entrance is on the fourth floor above the trees. You get the sense that you could just walk over the trees and, and have the sense of Canada that you can't achieve anywhere in Tokyo. And if the Japanese look at it, they'll see Tenjin Chi, you know, triangle, the top, four, heaven, Jing, the middle space, the fourth floor as people's space and the lower floor as chi, the earth. This is the Canada Garden. It is on the fourth floor, and what we have tried to do here is to introduce people to Canada. Its openness, accessibility, and interesting character. Not by people, but with geology. We take people from the Atlantic through the shield to the north. It's interesting that uh, you know the uh, the shields are are one of the oldest rock surfaces uh, on Earth, and uh, we think of Japan as a very old nation. But in terms of geology, Japan is very young. Here we use rocks and sand to articulate in miniature the Japanese landscape. And if we look at it very carefully, there are rock arrangements of different colored rocks to make a pattern. And the whole garden terminates with a large rock that's split. The split is not to show the split between the two nations, but the two nations coming together. Uh, Will's journey... Uh, the journey together, uh, I think, uh, has opened my eyes to how uh, another person uh, sees uh, the world quite differently from me, but at the same time.
time uh, there's a kind of a intertwining sort of a, of a, a part and uh, with different reasoning and uh, I found that a wonderful sort of uh, coming together of two individuals. I liked him very much from the first time I met him and we, we sort of took to each other. I liked the spiritual side in him. It's something I look for in the in people I run into and he had a deep spiritual side that I really enjoyed. And then he started telling me some of his experiences that underlined this, his, his journey through India for about a year, uh, following in the Buddhist path. I was very impressed by that. So I felt um, very close, a lot of rapport with him. And I felt he felt that with me. Japanese painting is nothing like the kind of things I do. I use Japanese themes, and I use what you might call Western forms, combine them in a, in a, in a marriage and an amalgam that might um, sort of help bridge these two uh, cultures. And anything that bridges cultures, anything that brings uh, cultures together is a step in a positive direction because the world is uh, just, um, uh, you know, pushing in the exact opposite direction. So this is a little tiny bit of resistance that I can offer. To retain hate only means continuing it. And where would it end? You can't continue to carry poison in the blood without infection. To really understand was to forgive. To understand that no one I know I might. has the corner on evil. I know I will. I hope I can forgive. Because I want to get rid of the poison in my mind, and I want to forgive. May God bless each and every one of you. May God bless Canada. Open the floodgates of war anywhere, and hellish monsters roam the earth. I often I think back and uh, think that maybe uh, perhaps the most important job I've done is to stop some of the projects. And, uh, I, and I'm sure th this doesn't go well with a technological society which counts on getting things done and, you know, they have a, a product. But maybe in terms of uh, long term, it's, uh, it's the thing that maybe you don't do that is important. And maybe this is the true understanding and compassion about life. Great broken tree stump, destroyed left to rot, a green sprig appears.
especially a child, uh, you know, about 13. And for me, nature became the solace that I could hang on to. Most POWs can't uh, really put it out of their minds, and uh, it comes up in so many different ways. But it's been a very positive thing in one sense, that it's, uh, it's given me a sense of value to each day, each moment. All I have to do is compare what my day today uh, looks like compared to how it was uh, one day there. And suddenly I'm, I'm in heaven again. Uh, I live each moment and each moment is precious, whether it's a question of something I eat or, or a walk I take or uh, a thing I'm painting. The sound of the surf, the sound of the wind in the trees, the breathing of gods. It is from the natural setting of my prison camp and our, uh, that was built on a level area with uh, not a chance of anything growing. It was almost like uh, uh, built on cinders with not a tree, not a shrub, nothing, absolutely flat. It was. Uh, once in a while, going, going to work to the shipyards, we'd see in the window of a house one little flower pot with a little flower. It would give me a little charge. Well, our, our uh, camp was just full of nature. We were up in the Rockies, and uh, it's a total contrast to the, your story. In my case, uh, nature became absolutely meaningful because uh, when your own country turns its back on you, there's nothing to rely on. You become somebody almost floating in air and trying to grapple and uh, get some stability. And especially I have an affinity with nature which is entirely emotional. I feel a tremendous charge when I'm walking in nature. And I have the wild grasses around me, the wild wheat and, and the wild flowers. And I'm never happier uh, than when I'm painting that. To commemorate the 100th anniversary of the first Japanese pioneer in Canada, a gift of sound, of gratitude and thankfulness. Ah, you hear that red-winged blackbird? You know, you know what they're singing? They're singing, I see you. Hear that? that that's, that's exactly how it sounds. That's it. You know, this natural setting, I often think of how different The practice of architecture is, to me, like trying to climb Mount Everest. And that's the beauty of architecture. The magic of life happens where three natural elements, land, air, and water, come together. It's fascinating when you think about it, 
in the English language. L for land, A for air, and W for water. That spells law. As a child growing up in Vancouver, my life was extremely simple. That's because I had decided to be an architect at the age of four and a half. That decision really made life very simple. I had to go to kindergarten, to public school, to high school, and to university. And so that's what I was going to do. And uh, so life was laid out. And you may be asking,